time we saw that we're interested to understand correlation functions we need 1 over z trace e to the minus beta h operator at time 0 operator at time t and I can rewrite operator at time t as e to the minus i h t and e to the plus i h t like so. And we saw that there's a lot of interesting physics in such operator combinations. For instance, if you want to understand physics close to equilibrium, you can understand it in terms, a lot of things at least, in terms of equilibrium physics at unequal times like this. And we'll look at something slightly more general. We'll look at trace e to the minus beta h and then an anti-time ordered series of operators going up to time t and then a time ordered series of operators going down back to time zero. And that's like a slightly more general, so here I talk about two operators, you could have more than two operators and as long as you have some operators here and some operators here, these ones are in time order, these are in anti-time order, and these all come to the right of these, then that's the kind of correlation I'll talk about. That's not the only kinds of correlations you could have. As soon as you have four or more operators, you can put them into orderings which don't appear here like early, late, early, late. You can't do with this. And if for some reason you find yourself needing a correlation function of four operators in some bizarre order, then you have to do something a little more general than what I'm writing. Um, and I struggle to think of a single example where you really need that. Maybe that's over strong. I think there's probably somewhere there's one or two examples. But what we do here will be sufficient and um, what's important is it will develop operators of this form de um, lie in a perturbation theory which is internally, com which is complete in the sense that you don't need any operators outside of this form to study it. Okay, and I'm going to draw a picture of how we're going to do this. Um, this is, so here's time, and here's imaginary time, and this, remember because the people who developed quantum mechanics were left-handed or uh, came from Jewish, Muslim, or South Asian backgrounds, they all worked from here towards here instead of from here towards here. I don't know if that's true, I just like it as a statement. Okay, <laughs> so you have to think of this as the first thing and then you go towards these things as the later things. And so the first thing that happens is I evolve from time zero. So here you're at t equals zero. And I evolve forward in time to time t. Then I evolve backwards in time, back to time zero. And then I have my density matrix, which because I'm in equilibrium, we already saw looks like, it isn't, but it looks like, evolving in the Euclidean or imaginary time direction to here. And then this trace is periodicity, which says that I connect this point to that point by identifying the values. Okay, and that's what we're doing, and this is called the anything, anything good has lots of names. This is called the closed time path. Or the Schwinger. Keldish 
contour. So this is a picture of what it means. And in practice, it's going to work as follows. As usual, when I see an evolution equation uh, uh, operator, sorry, like this or like this or like this, I'm going to break it into a whole bunch of tiny little pieces. Okay, so I'm going to write this as 1 over z trace e to the minus beta h over n, e to the minus beta h over n. That's a, this one chopped up into a whole bunch of pieces. Maybe an operator. This one chopped into a whole bunch of pieces. e to the i h t over n, e to the i h t over n. Operator, e to the minus i h t over n, e to the minus i h t over n. Out with some huge number of pieces in here, a huge number of pieces in here, and a huge number of pieces in here. You all know what to do next. Insert complete sets of states. Okay, so I'm going to insert a complete set of states here, which I'll call, no, I, I better not call them. and here and here, and these I will label from the first one, sorry, from the first one to the last one with a label I'll call tau. So this end is tau equals zero, and this end is tau equals beta. And this tau is exactly where I am along this line. And these ones I will label with a time So I insert another whole bunch of them in here. And those are labeled with the time t. And that time runs from t equals 0 there up to t equal, uh, sorry, t prime is 0 up to t prime is t here. And that is running along here. And then I insert a final additional set of states here. And these are labeled also with a t prime, which runs from t to 0, or from 0 to t, back to 0, and to beta. And then the trace connects you from there to there. OK? And this is very important. These complete sets of states are distinct and independent from these. They have nothing to do with each other. They're in separate complete sets of states. And this is a separate complete set of states as well. So I better label them. And I'm going to name these 1, 2, and 3. Okay. And so when I write this as a path integral, so I have to do one integration over every complete set of states. That looks like a path integral. That gives me three d phi's over the first set of states, the second, and the third. And then from here, I get an integral over a Minkowski action density or Lagrange density um, from time 0 to t with the factor i. And this is a factor of plus i because this is a factor of minus i. And there is, as always, a minus sign associated with 
um, the Legendre transform from Hamiltonian to Lagrangian, as you know. Okay. From here, I then have an x of an integral from 0 to t dt prime minus i times Lagrangian of phi 2 d3x. This is a minus because this is a plus. And there's a minus sign in the, in the Legendre transform from a Hamiltonian to a Lagrangian. And finally, I have an integral over the Euclidean action density. I keep forgetting my d3x's. Um, which is exactly the same as the one we saw where we didn't bother with all of this stuff. Okay. Now, oh, and my operators. If I didn't have these operators, this and this precisely cancel. Well, sorry, the phi 1, phi 2 integral of this and this is 1. That's because this forward time evolver and this backward time evolver are the same. Well, they're daggers of each other. It's only the fact that this operator is inserted in here and that operator ordering matters that I have to keep them both. Okay. Now you know the most comfortable way to do things is not to explicitly insert these operators because if you do that, you have to rebuild the whole path integral every time you want a different pair of operators. And you also don't have any sort of clear, transparent way of building a perturbation theory with these guys. And so what I want to do instead is I want to attach an external current sorry it's, if it, it's either var phi or it isn't okay so I'm going to modify my Lagrangians by the addition of an external current which allows me by differentiation to pull down copies of phi out of each one of these things and thereby build operators. So then I don't have to write the operators here. Okay. But, and now this is important, I want to be able to place my operators where I want. Here, somewhere inside of here, here, somewhere inside of here, somewhere inside of here, wherever I want. Not always in the same place. And that means if I do it the way I just wrote, when I differentiate with respect to j, it could act here or here. So I have to make these, not only are these distinct phi's, because I inserted distinct complete sets of states, but I should use distinct j's for these three insertions so that by variation I can insert operators in any ordering here that I feel like. Okay? Yes? Just a quick question. We had periodicity boundary conditions on the field phi originally when you defined the graph integral. Now there should also be boundary conditions on all of the fields that connect them with each other. Right? right. So the fact that this is next to this says that the end of this is the beginning of that. The end of this is the beginning of that. And the end of this is the beginning of that. In this picture, only this last one is a surprise. But you're right, in this path integral, if you want, you can put little links like that to remind yourself that the last phi 1 is the first phi 2, the last phi 2 is the first phi 3, and the last phi 3 is the first phi 1. With, for fermions, one total overall minus sign when you go all the way around. Which I may as well put between this and this.
Okay. Um, now, as usual, so I'm going to write this thing as L1, L2, and L3. Where by those I mean the ones built out of the phi 1, the phi 2, and the phi 3 fields. Okay? And um, e to the i integral L1, I'm going to write this as a A, oh, sorry. So this guy in here, I'm going to write as a combination of a free and interacting and a external current contribution. Okay. And as usual, variations with respect to J1 pull down factors of phi. And that means that when I write this interaction part, I can replace each phi with a minus i variation with respect to J, if I want, right? And that will give me, when I then expand, the inter in the interaction part, that will give me a perturbative expansion. Okay. But I have to do the same thing for L2 and for L3. And that means that I'm going to get a bit of perturbation expansion where I have three kinds of vertices. Actually, because having the equilibrium distribution at time zero and having the equilibrium distribution at time minus infinity are the same thing, the equilibrium distribution commutes with time evolution. I can actually push this guy back and have him go down or her or whatever at minus infinity and it doesn't change anything. And in practice, that almost means that you can ignore this part. Not quite. And we'll see what not quite means uh, in a very specific way in a couple of minutes. But you can almost ignore this. And so I'm going to concentrate on the part of the problem involving L1 and L2. And the result is that supposing that I ask the following question. What is the expectation value of phi at x phi at y. And here, the ordering matters. This is first, this is second. OK. That means that this I have to achieve by a variation with respect to j1. And this I have to achieve with a variation with respect to j2. And so this is a phi 1 and this is a phi 2 because that's the way to make sure that they're in the specific order that I wrote there. These are not time ordered. These are the order that I wrote. Okay? So this thing I will call g sub 2 1 of x and y because it's the correlator between a type 2 field and a type 1 field. And these indices 2 1 which some people write as minus plus, depending on who your advisor was or who their advisor was or who their advisor was. You either write this with twos and ones or you write it with minuses and pluses. But I won't do this because my advisor, well, okay. Um, <laughs>
This is also called the Whiteman greater than function, especially if your advisor was Whiteman, which it wasn't. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is, I think, an older notation. Who cares? Um, so that's the correlator of one of these two guys with one of these one guys. And I could calculate it perturbatively. And at lowest order, I just have a 1 and a 2, and I connect them with a G21, running from one to the other. And at the next order, I have to perturb not only in L1, but also in L2. So I could have, for instance, in scalar phi to the fourth theory, I could have a vertex here, which is all 2s, or a vertex here, which is all 1s. And so here, so I get a G21, and then here I get a minus I lambda G11, G11, G12, with an integral D4Z for the location where the vertex happens. And this is of Z minus Z. It's the loop. And this is of z minus y, and this is of x minus z. Uh, yeah. So this is this guy, this is this guy, and this is this loop guy. And here I have the same thing, but with a plus. And a 2-2, two, two, a 1-2, and a 2-2 two, two correlator. Yes? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, well, it's, for me, it's difficult to see why that uh, two-point correlation function is not an I mean, because you are now. This one. Yeah. Well, I'll talk about that in just a moment. Okay. Why would, but why would it? I mean, because at the end, you have to set J1 J and J2 to 0, right? And yeah, but I vary. <laughs> pulling down these guys, and then I set them to zero. Uh, Your argument would say that all correlation functions are zero, period. Uh, well, because I, I still don't see how the action is like, so. So, I mean, I make two variations with respect to, so, sorry. This thing with j's in it, I call z of j1, j2, and j3. And what I really meant here is that you should take a J1 and a J2 derivative of Z of J1, J2, J3, and then set all the J's to zero. I'm just wondering about and the And this it's term. what? I'm just wondering about the quad uh, term of the Okay. In the absence of a quartic term in the free theory, I just have this, and it isn't zero because I take two j derivatives of j propagator j, and I get something that's not zero. The point is that there's a propagator between fields over here and fields over here. Um, it's important here that the end boundary of one is the beginning boundary of the other. They are attached to each other. They know about each other. They can correlate with each other. We'll see what the correlator is in a moment. OK. This looks hopelessly different than everything you've learned. OK. Um, in particular, at some high order, what it can look like, and let's say that I wanted to do something more complicated. Let's say I wanted two phi ones and two phi twos. So I wrote it wrong. The phi twos are over here. The phi ones are over here. These are time ordered. These are anti-time ordered. Because this thing happens in anti-time ordering, and this thing happens in time ordering. 
So this is the ordering specified correlator of two time-ordered and two anti-time-ordered things. And the most general diagram is you write your phi ones over here. You write some vertices here. You draw a line, you write some vertices here. And here you have phi 2 and phi 2. And then you connect everything however you want. This could connect to this vertex, and that goes across to here, and bing, 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 bing. Um, whatever. I guess I had cubic and quartic interactions in my theory here. Now I'll just add a couple more lines, and then they're all quartic. Okay. Bing, bing, boom, bing, boom. <laughs> These are one vertices. These are two. Every propagator that lives over here, like this one, is a 2, 2 propagator. These are 1, 1 propagators. And all these ones are 1, 2, or if you view them the other way around, 2, 1 propagators. And this looks like a horrendous mess, OK? And it is. And you say, but wait a minute. If I just make beta infinitely big, I have vacuum. And I know that vacuum is beautifully simple, and I don't have to deal with any of this garbage. So what's the deal, man? Oh, and just to be a little bit more explicit. Uh, can I ask something for you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. So in what, in what sense is this now different from the case in which there's no temperature? It's not. That's what we'll see. No temperature is just the beta to infinity limit. And all that's going to do is change the specific forms of my G's. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. So what I have is I have a G21, a G12, a G22, and a G11. These are the guys, just depending on which direction you decide to put your arrow, that lead you across this gap. These are the ones living on one side. These are the ones living on the other side. This is the time-ordered correlator of two operators. This is the anti-time-ordered correlator of two operators. This is operator x minus x comma y. This is operator of y, operator of x. This is operator of x, operator of y. Just the two possible explicit specific orders that you could put the operators. Um, so this is called G greater, and this is called G less than, and this is called G anti Feynman, and this is called G Feynman. Or this is also called G anti time, and this is called G time, depending on who's writing it. Okay. This is familiar to you from vacuum field theory. This is just what the propagator looks like in M dagger, the, the conjugate of the matrix element in normal field theory. And these we have to explore. And the way to explore them is to just calculate it. And the way to calculate it is to say, I could calculate it if I had time. No, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of the details. So let's think about G21. G21. That is, and I'm going to do this in vacuum. So that's vacuum. 5x, 5y, vacuum. If this, uh, I may as well make y zero, right? Because translation invariance. And next I'm going to write explicitly the x vector dependence here and the time x0 is the same thing as time, right? So I'm writing explicitly the time evolution here and here. And now I will insert a complete set of states here. 
sum over n, n, n. There or no? No, that's a stupid place to insert it. I'm sorry. I will insert it here. I'm going to name n operator on zero vacuum to be C sub n. Okay. It's just a name. This is the amplitude for the field phi to act on the vacuum and create my state n. Okay. And then here, I'm going to mention that e to the minus i h x zero acting on n can be written as e to the minus i e n x zero acting on n. And this is no longer an operator. I pull it out. This acting on the vacuum gives one if I've sensibly set my vacuum energy to zero. Okay. So this I can actually throw out. It don't do nothing. And then up to the fact that I have this x vector sitting here, which just will pick out when I Fourier transform only those ends which have a specific uh, three vector momentum. This thing is again, So let me call that cn of 0, where the 0 is the space coordinate. So what I get here, g21 of x is e to the minus uh, is the sum over n, e to the minus i e n t times cn of 0, cn star of x. OK. And the point I want to make is that this is obviously and transparently only non-zero for positive frequencies. If I Fourier transform this sucker, I will get a contribution at every en where this isn't zero. I will get a zero for any negative frequency. Because this is built entirely out of positive frequency things. OK? And so in fact, what I'm going to get is um, with a tiny bit more work, g greater than of p, when I Fourier transform it completely, is going to be theta of p0 times my spectral function of p squared. And the spectral function is the same one that we met in the uh, Schelen Lehmann representation. <laughs> so, if you prefer, for a free theory, this thing is um, 2 pi delta of p squared plus m squared theta of p0. Excuse me, this is the Hibiscite function. Of P yes. So it's like the positive energy condition. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is only supported at positive frequencies, and so I only get the positive frequency side of the spectral function. And that means that in this crazy picture, everything which crosses this line has to be positive energy crossing this line. And that means that I can think of all of these things as being final state particles, right? I send in particles. These, if they each have a positive frequency, they have to be final state particles, 
okay? I never have any energy going back this direction. So the sum of these energies has to equal how much energy I put in. And the sum of the momenta because of the vertices conserve momentum. Furthermore, what is this? This is an on-shell condition. So in vacuum, these are on-shell final state particles. All these guys. So if they're on-shell final state particles, what are they doing in the middle of a diagram? So my diagram looks like some incoming particles, a blob with a whole bunch of vertices and propagators in it, and all those propagators are time ordered, and then a bunch of final state things, which are on shell. And that's the object I usually call M, my matrix element. And then something receiving the final state particles as if their frequencies are the other way around. A whole bunch of anti-time ordered propagators. And my in states again. And this is the thing I usually call M star. The Hermitian conjugate of the matrix element. And if I ask the question about a correlator of some field and precisely the same field that precisely the same, well, precisely minus the frequencies and momenta, then what I learn is the final state integrated or summed cross section. Okay. So what you're doing here, so what you usually do in field theory is you find some clever trick that you only have to bother doing one half of this problem and then you use the fact that the other half has to look the same. Okay. And here we just explicitly see each half of the problem. Okay. And that's how what we're doing connects to the usual um, vacuum perturbation theory. So vacuum perturbation theory actually has four kinds of propagators. Well, these are the same. These are Hermitian conjugates of each other. And what we're doing is we're explicitly writing things which contain both the matrix element and its dagger. That's all. OK. Yes? Um, so let's say we have phi 1 going to 3 phi 2. You know what I mean? There's an yes. between initial states and phi Okay. So, so if I have one phi 1 over here and three phi 2's over here and they're the same particle type, then in vacuum I will not find a way to do that through a set of on-shell intermediate particles if this is on-shell and these are on-shell. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's partly what questions you ask. Um, but, I mean, remember, if I put something different here from here, the question I'm actually asking is not, does one thing go to three things? It is, can one thing go to the same final state which three things could go to? Which is a different question. Okay, and it's not usually the question you're asking in vacuum field theory. So in vacuum field theory, usually just by construction, the questions you ask have to do with this thing looking like this thing. Okay. So what goes different at finite temperature? Well, at finite temperature, instead of having the vacuum here, I have the thermal density matrix. e to the minus beta h, and then I have e to the i h x zero operator at x, e to the minus i h x zero operator at zero. Okay, instead of the vacuum, I have this thing. 
this thing can start me out with a state which has positive energy. And then that energy can go down. And I do get contributions with the opposite sign. And so to evaluate this, I have to insert here a complete set of M states and here a complete set of N states. and work a little bit and it's completely straightforward to show you get e to the minus beta em that's because this e to the minus beta h acts straight on em and then I get an e to the i em minus en t and then I get m phi at x n n phi of zero m. In Fourier space, if I Fourier transform this from x and x zero to p and p zero, then these phases here in the time integration forces P0 equal to En minus Em. So only Ns and Ms which differ by the Fourier coefficient that I choose to study show up in this sum. If I do the same thing with, this is always dangerous. If I do the same thing with Mr. Less than, then this is the one at x because that's the one at x this is a plus and this is a minus and this is the one at zero okay so I put the one at some time here and then it has an e to the plus i h x here and an e to the minus i h x zero here, which I moved around to there because it commutes with that and can move around the trace. So that was all okay. And all that changed is I flipped this sign. And I flipped m and n in this expression, so that this is m and this was n. Now all I have to do is re is that clear? Was that too fast? This is just algebra, okay? So uh, you, you can do it slowly, patiently at home. And what you're supposed to do now is believe me. Um, so if I put the x guy here, then all that I've done essentially is I've reversed you can say I've reversed the sign of x0, I've reversed the role of m and n. And then I just have to rename m to n. That puts a plus here again, makes this an m and this an n again, but it makes this an n. And so my answer is different. It's different by whether it's em or en sitting in here. And that means that and how much do those differ from each other? Oh, by this much. So, g greater than has e to the minus beta em. g less than has e to the minus beta en. And en minus em is p0. Notice I've not used perturbation theory. All I've used is that these are operators and I'm doing quantum mechanics. That's all I've used. Okay, so this is not dependent on what these operators are. They could be stress tensors. They could be anything you want. Okay, and it's not dependent on what this theory is. It could be QCD. It could be your favorite early universe model. So these two energies factors differ 
by the frequency which you use to analyze things. And that tells you that G less than of P0 and P is e to the minus beta P0 <laughs> times G greater than of P0 and P. And this is called the Kubo Martin Schwinger or KMS relation. Okay? And this is true. It's not some leading in perturbative something, something, something. It's just true. Okay? That means not all of these guys are independent of each other. There's another linear dependence, which is also just true. If I add these two together, I get the time ordered plus the anti-time ordered. That's the sum of the two orderings. If I add these two together, I get one ordering plus the other ordering. That's the sum of the two orderings. That means that G12 plus G21 equals GT plus G11 plus G22. They're not all independent. There's one linear combination, a linear dependence between them. Why is that? Um, just explicitly, this is 1, 2. This is 2, 1. This is 1, 2. OK, I'll write it very quickly. <laughs> Okay. Okay. This is <laughs> this is one ordering. This is the other ordering. This is one ordering at positive times and the other at negative times. This is the other at positive times and the one at negative times. So at positive times, this is two one and this is one two, and in negative times, this is two one uh, one two and this is two one. So at both positive and negative times, these add up to these. Okay. So in a free theory, what we find, g greater than p is 2 pi delta of p squared plus m squared times 1 plus both a statistical function of p0 over t. So this is the same as the vacuum one, except with a 1 replaced by 1 plus Bose. g less than is given here in terms of g greater than Oh, and this is a plus because of my metric convention. If you have the other metric convention, it's a minus. And here it's just n bosa. At zero temperature, n bosa is zero. And this is zero and this is one. Ah, at positive frequencies. At negative frequencies, careful. At negative frequencies, n bosa is minus one. One over e to the energy uh, p0 over t minus 1. If I make p0 negative and t 0, then this is exponentially small and this is a minus. So it's minus 1. So these guys flip sign when you go to negative frequencies. This is minus 1 and this is 0. So they trade roles. And the sum of the two, g greater plus g less than, is the spectral function. Um, um, no, 1 plus 2 n bosa. Sorry. Spectral function times 1 plus 2 n bosa. OK. Meanwhile, gt you're completely used to, it's minus i over p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. That's what you're used to. 
except maybe with a plus here, a minus here, and a plus here, depending on your metric. Plus, oops, 2 pi n bose delta of p squared plus m squared. This is not the vacuum value, it's different. It has some extra thing which vanishes in vacuum but doesn't vanish away from vacuum. So your time and anti-time ordered correlation functions are dragging around thermal effects as well as telling about propagation. Okay. How do you get rid of that? Well, there's a beautiful combination that you can take instead, um, which I guess, so that everyone can see it, I will write up here. I can define G retarded as theta of T times G greater minus G less than. This is just time positivity and this is that I'm asking about the commutator of the two operators. That is the usual meaning of the retarded function. Okay. And after some modest amount of annoying work, just taking these definitions, so this I can write as theta 1, theta 2, theta function plus theta 2, theta 1 theta bar function and similarly here with the opposite order and I just mess around for a while and I discover that this is the same thing as one half of g21 minus g12 plus g11 minus g22. And that when I take that specific precise combination, <coughs> I guess this is a minus. I don't know, I'm 50% wrong to have the, I'm 50% likely to have the signs on the epsilons wrong. This is the usual retarded function. It has no thermal part. When I take the correct linear combination here, all the thermal stuff cancels. And the retarded function is the vacuum retarded function at tree level or in the free theory. At the interacting level, it is not. Okay. So why is the specular function appearing there? Where? In the G... Here? Yeah. Um, so, so the... the qu okay, so... I mean, the, the, the short answer is because when you actually calculate it, this is what you find. Um, that's not a terribly good physical explanation. Um, so, so let me explain this here. If I start with a vacuum, I can create a single particle state. It propagates and I catch it on the other side. That's what this teaches me about. Therefore, I only see single particle states. But if I started with an occupied single particle state and I try to create it, I get a Bose stimulation factor. And so I get a 1 plus n Bose. And that's what I see. Okay? So that's, the, that's, the, that's this guy. Okay, GT, I'm playing these games with the orders of the operators. And the part where I was acting on the vacuum, you know, gives you this. But there's also the stimulated part. 
okay? And so there's a contribution where this acts on a state that already has something and stimulates it. Okay, and after some work, you find that you get this. Okay, I don't, I don't know if there's a transparent way to see that, of course, that's the case. When I take this commutator, sorry, when I take this, yeah, this commutator is this difference. And you can kind of see it here that when I take this difference, the bosas are getting canceled and I'm keeping only the one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a way of making a combination where I don't notice this thermal effect. So regardless of what order I set my operators, when I hit a state that's occupied, I get the stimulation factor. Okay, any order, time ordered, Whiteman ordered, anti-Whiteman ordered, if there's something here, then I pick it up. But when I take the difference of two orderings, then it cancels. And the time ordering is not the difference of two orderings, so it doesn't cancel. Maybe that's a better way of thinking about it. Okay. And now, having done all of this work, I'm going to tell you that this is actually a slightly inconvenient choice. Um, so, the number of things that can be usefully calculated with this formalism is not quite as like, uh, high as I'd like to pretend, although I think that it is a useful formalism. But it turns out that when you try to do calculations, they're incredibly opaque in this one, two, uh, notation, and it's better to redefine a different linear combination called the RA basis. R, phi R is defined as phi 1 plus phi 2 over 2, and phi A is defined as phi 1 minus phi 2. This is just rotating the 1, 2 basis by 90 degrees. Okay, and that's clever because the retarded function is exactly RA. And hence the notation is R to A. And the advanced function is GAR. And the advanced function is just the retarded function if you follow the line in the opposite direction. So you actually only ever need one of them. The other thing you have is g little r r, and that's one quarter of g one one plus g two two plus g two one plus g one two, which by this relation, um, where did it go? Here, is the same as one half of the thing with just these guys. And that is um, n boza plus a half times gr minus ga, also known as the discontinuity of the retarded function, also known as the spectral function. So the way to think about this is the GR is propagation and G little rr is statistical correlation. This is the fact that things can be correlated because of vacuum fluctuations. This is the fact that things can be correlated because of thermal fluctuations. Oh, and there's a combination I didn't write here, GAA. So here's RA, AR, RR, that leaves AA. It's zero. That's why this is a good, that's a reason this is a good basis. This basis is more transparent. Instead of having some 
completely weird linear combination vanishing. It's just straight up one of the things is zero. And the other ones have their roles. One tells about correlations in your system. And one tells about how things propagate. And the one that tells about how things propagate is at tree level, the same as in vacuum. And the other one at tree level is, well, it's this except with a half. It's strictly on shell. So this is on shell. And this is as in vacuum. At lowest order, at lowest order. And furthermore, if I actually have them as full functions at non perturbatively or at some loop order or whatever, this relation between them is exact. So if I can calculate one of these guys, gr, I can dagger it to get ga, and then take the discontinuity to get the rr. And so knowing one gives you all of them. This is another rewriting of the same KMS relation. Whereas in this basis I had two kinds of vertices, vertices with all ones and vertices with all twos. Over here, all vertices, so a vertex with all ones my, minus a vertex with all twos. There's always a minus sign because this came from exponentiating e to the minus i h t and this from e to the plus i h t. That's why there's this minus sign. This minus sign means that there always has to be an odd number of phi a's. So this corresponds to a vertex with three r's and one a plus I think with a one quarter a vertex with three a's. So every vertex gives you an A. It therefore forces a, G, a retarded function um, propagator. As you know, every time you add a loop, you add one more propagator than vertex. So you can have one more GRR per loop. So when you draw a diagram, if for instance I want to know the retarded function itself, so I want to correlate an R with an A, I can do that with a retarded propagator, or I can do that with a vertex. So here's an R, then I put an A here, an R, an A, and two R's there. If I attach this to an R, then I have to put the A over there. And then I have an A, A, that's zero. If I put an A here and an R there, I also get zero because I have a loop which is retarded and starts where it ends. It has a theta function that it has to move forward in time, but it starts where it ends, so that's zero. So this is the only contribution. And here I see that I get a GRR. And that means that this is proportional to 1 plus 2 n Bose, or let's say 1 half plus n Bose. And then if I have two loops, here's an R, then I put an A here, an R here, an A there. Then these can all be R's, but one of these has to have an A, and then I get a retarded propagators here, and I get See, no, that's the backwards, that's a, uh, uh, shoot, I wrote it backwards. You always write things as going from A's to R's. So the arrows are the flow of time. 
things move from early to late following a retarded propagator. So this vertex is at the earliest time, later, later, last. Here, pre-existing correlations in my system influence these two vertices in a correlated way, and that's what these RR propagators are there to tell you about. So this involves a one-half plus n bolsa squared. And you see, with every power of lambda, I can get one more power of n bolsa. If you're interested in infrared phenomena, n bolsa is big. And that means that you can have things proportional to n bolsa lambda to some power. And for a sufficiently infrared scale, that's not convergent. This is exactly the same problem we had in equal time correlators, which pushed us to this 3D theory and made this 3D theory non-perturbative. Okay, and so it recurs, and this is another way of seeing why it comes about. Every loop order gives you a power of the coupling, but it can also give you a power of existing correlations in your system. And if this combination is not small, which happens suitably far in the infrared, then the perturbative expansion fails. Okay. That's not the only reason the perturbative expansion can fail. Oh, and by the way, where is this done in the best and most detailed way? Okay. Um, in my opinion, um, the nicest formulation I've seen of this, which goes actually quite a ways beyond what I've just done is by it was in Simon Carognot's master's thesis uh, d yeah okay So, take some ugly diagram, okay, and now add another loop, okay. Let's say, for instance, that I had an R and an R here, an AR and an RR, for instance. So that this was an A going off to an R, and this is an R going off to an A, for instance. Okay, before I added this loop, this diagram had a statistical function on it. This diagram had a statistical function on it. And this was a retarded function, carrying information from the past to the future. Okay, when I add another loop here, so now I don't know what's going to happen here. I add a loop here. At this vertex and at this vertex, I have to put an A somewhere. Okay. So I put an A here, and I put an A, I don't know, here. Okay. This is now a retarded going up to this. Yeah, that's okay. Those are retarded, but now this has two R's, and this has two R's. So where I had two cut diagrams, now I have, uh, cut lines, now I have three. Yeah, wouldn't it just add another one half plus NB? Yes, lambda? so I get an extra one half plus NB, and it multiplies lambda. Okay, so, okay, so really there's a half oh, here. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. okay. 1 half plus nb is approximately t over omega. And the first correction, first of all, is down by two powers. At, at small omega over t, it's down by two powers and has a tiny little coefficient. So this expansion, the sort of, this is a classical expansion, is to throw out this. This is the classical statistical approximation, and its corrections
happen at about pi t scale. Not t, pi t. Okay. Yeah, if you have four points, it's RRRA, and if it's three points, it's RRA. It is always with an odd number of A's. So the fact that the two branches have the opposite sign means you always have an odd number of A's. This guy eats up two of your statistical functions. It's usually subdominant, but you still need it. Okay? If you ignore this and you make this approximation, then you're doing classical field theory. If you ignore this and you make this approximation, you leave in the half, then you're doing classical field theory but treating the quantum initial fluctuations as if they're real classical stuff. That turns out to have some weird ultraviolet catastrophe divergences which are fixed by this. But I don't have time to talk about that. So we have now a formalism and it's actually the best formalism you're going to get for trying to calculate a weak coupling these real-time phenomena. And you might hope that now all of our problems are solved and we can go and do things. And you will be, well, maybe bitterly disappointed is too strong, but um, life is not as good as you hoped. And that is not because this formalism is bad, it's because the problems are hard. Okay? So, as we see here, there are infrared issues. As I go to higher loop order, more and more powers of the Bose statistical function can enter. If I have fermions, by the way, I forgot to say this. If I have fermions, everywhere you saw a n Bose put in a minus n Fermi. And so these are halves, they're all minus a half plus n Fermi. This minus is the minus of fermionic loops having minus signs. But the thermal effects of fermionic loops have plus signs. And this shouldn't surprise you, this is exactly the combination we saw earlier when we did thermodynamics. Okay. Um, so there are IR issues. Now, one person's issue is another person's solution. What's going on? This is a classical field theory behavior. If you do straight up classical field theory, it has exactly the same perturbative expansion as what we just saw, except you can forget about this. It's not there. And wherever you have 1 half plus n boza, you just straight off replace it with t over omega. But it has exactly the same retarded function, the same correlator function, it's the same. And there's some nice papers in the mid-1990s by who, which I forgot to write down, by Gert Arts. where he explores that in more detail. And I'll just make a remark. What are you doing when you make this classical approximation? Well, we had this contour at the beginning that I followed like this in the time domain. And this was this imaginary part of extent beta, and this was this forward and backward. I make the following two approximations. Since I'm interested in the infrared, this is a short distance. So I assume that my field is constant here. That gives me an e to the minus beta h of phi treated as a constant just value, which is exactly the thermal classical statistical um, distribution. So this just instructs me to sample my fields as if they were classical fields at a temperature. And here I make the stationary phase a 
approximation. That's the same as classical field evolution. It means that the equations in motion are to be interpreted literally as the evolution equations for your fields. That gives you, if you expand it as a perturbation theory, exactly the perturbation theory I just described here, dropping this and making this approximation. Or it just straight up gives you classical real-time dynamics. And classical real-time dynamics you can solve. I didn't mention the path integral we set up had i's in the exponentials. That means there is no important sampling you can do. Lattice non-perturbative techniques don't work. Um, sorry. They can deal with this part, but they can't deal with this part. Um, but classical field theory can be solved in real time. It's not even terribly hard. In fact, the hybrid algorithm we heard about in the earlier lectures if you then do it in three dimensions and you interpret the time variable literally is exactly how you solve this. Okay. Um, so, you know, this is actually a good thing. It means that we have a different tool that we can solve things fully non-perturbatively. There are interesting questions there, um, but it doesn't really work. No, let, let's put it differently. Um, There are pitfalls. As Burdecker, McLaren, and Smilga pointed out, um, I'll just give you the archive reference. This is back when the archives each had their own front address. And then, as was discussed in more detail by Arnold, Son, and Yaffe in 9609-481, and subsequent papers, this classical evolution has UV divergent effects. And understanding, not in its thermodynamics, in its dynamics. In understanding what those are and what they do is a complicated story, which I therefore will not tell you in the next four minutes. Um, but let's just put it this way. When we looked at this thing in the previous lecture as this 3D effective theory, which is the same thing as this thing treating the fields as being constant, we had this Fij, Fij, and then we had this D0 Ai, D0 Ai, no, Dia0, all things that we expected. And then we had something funny, md squared over 2a0, a0. And we wondered, what is that? And why do I use a d here? I use a d here because this is Debye screening. And this is the Debye mass, or Debye is people who haven't had Gert Arts tell them that they're mangling nice Dutch words. Would say it. Um, this is what it looks like at equal time. But you know that if I try to apply that and find that, you know, in, in the real time domain, this looks non gauge invariant. And so it must have some gauge invariant continuation into the real time domain. And this is called the hard thermal loops. And it's very, very non-trivial. This, if when you apply it into the time domain, has some complex structure which has um, multiple, it's not just quadratic in fields. It has higher order in fields content that has to get resummed. Um, 
the completely unreadable original paper about that is by Broughton and Pizarski. Uh, slightly before the archive, you might have to go to a library. Remember those? And these hard thermal loops, they mean that the actual structure of, say, our retarded function is trickier than you expected. So here's frequency, or energy, fre let's say frequency and wave number. Here's the light cone. In vacuum, things propagate along the light cone. So if you ask about the statistical function, it's supported all along the light cone. These finite temperature effects mean that it's supported, first of all, slightly off the light cone. And second of all, there's some sort of smear of additional stuff in the space-like region. Okay. And rather than being a strictly fixed mass, this thing is also smeared out with some width. So there's a g squared t width here. There's a g squared t squared effective mass squared here. And there's so-called Landau damping here. And then this is the really funny part. For bosons, this is the transverse guys, and they come down to some value here. And the longitudinal guys and the transverse guys can't be distinguished at that point. But the longitudinal guys come up, and they run out of statistical weight, and they approach the axis fast, while this approaches the axis slow. And the mass squared you have here is different than the mass squared you would determine from here. Ah! And for fermions, a similar thing happens. They don't lie on the light cone. They come down to here, and they actually hit here with a slope. And then crawl up here and run out of statistical weight. That's the plus, plus chirality. And the minus chirality comes down here, crosses like that, and does the same thing. So even if the mass is zero, and the left and right movers don't couple to each other, they both propagate as if they're massive, which is kind of weird. And then they can even move backwards, but with very, very small spectral weight. So there's weird things. There are strange things done in the midnight sun. Oh, sorry, that's something else. And there's one more thing I have to ca caution you about. And this will be the last thing, and then we're done for today. It's just a remark. When we asked about the, the viscosity, we saw that it was a limit, as the frequency went to zero, of a TXY, TXY correlator. at frequency and at k vanishing. Txy is a composite operator. That means it attaches to two lines. And at lowest order, I would just say, well, connect this line to here and this line to here. OK? And put in a tiny little frequency here. And then I would have a momentum running, and I'll call this Q, which is almost exactly zero. And then I have P running along here, and I have Q minus P running along here, which is approximately minus P. And then something funny happens. Wherever this has its poles, this has its poles at exactly the same frequency. Plus or minus this tiny little external. 
Okay. So you can arrange it so that what you're asking about is about the retarded, retarded function. Okay. <coughs> but this is at minus p. So the retarded function has two poles just below the axis. The retarded function of minus p has two poles just above the axis. And those poles, because I'm putting in almost no frequency, are at the same place. And then I'm supposed to do the frequency integral along this axis, this contour. Whether I close that contour above or below, it will pick up the residue of these poles. And those residues are enhanced by how close they are to the other pole, which is, at the free level, divergent. <gasps> at the interacting level, these things move apart from each other by distance of order, the scattering, um, the um, scattering width. Okay, so when I so if I don't include interaction corrections, I get infinity. If I include interaction corrections, so these things actually have a width, then I get something which is large. So this is of order one over my scattering width. It's big. Okay, and here's the problem. If I add another line here, going across, carrying a momentum k, then here I have p plus k, and here I have q minus p minus k. And then I have one loop integral here, and another loop integral here. And this same thing happens to each one of them. So I get a 1 over width plus alpha over width squared, plus alpha squared over width cubed when I put another one in there, etc. How big is this width? Well, it's of order alpha. And every term in that series is parametrically as big as every other term, and you have to resum it. So even though I might be in a perturbative regime, and even if my particles are massive, so the infrared effects we talked about aren't there, nevertheless, I have to sum some infinite series of diagrams to so get even at the leading order the right behavior. And what this is, is that these, these particles can physically propagate a long distance from here to here. And these so-called pinching poles, every now and then you'll read some paper saying, I solved the pinching pole problem, it doesn't happen anymore. And it must be wrong. Because these carry information about something physically important, that particles can propagate a long distance. So I can disturb a particle with a stress tensor. It propagates. It scatters, but not enough to completely change what it's doing. Propagates some more, maybe scatters again, and then arrives and carries information. And that's what I'm trying to sum. And I have to include the fact that I have these propagations. And this series can be resummed, as was shown by um, now where do I have ah as was shown by Sang Yong Jun in his PhD thesis. In a highly unreadable paper. Um, but very important. It's more than 50 Physical Review D pages. Um, but it's packed with good stuff. And it explains these issues of resummations in um, full detail. And um, would have been easier in this formalism, as we showed,
in an almost equally unreadable paper a few years later. Um, so that's what I wanted to tell you about. The summary, I guess, if you want to do unequal time phenomena, this is the right formalism. You write this contour where time goes forward and then backward to connect to a statistical function. And then you write the average and difference variables um, between the two contours. And the correlators are retarded functions and statistical correlation functions. Um, there are many things that make it complicated to use this formalism, all of which are physics. And one thing is that in the infrared, you have large statistical factors which destroy perturbation theory. And that's real physics. And you might be able to treat it by treating that physics as a classical field theory. But it's a classical field theory in the environment of the quantum mechanical fluctuations at shorter distances, which influence its dynamics in a way which is not so simple. Um, even absent those infrared effects, if the question you're asking is about very low frequencies or long times, then the fact that particles can propagate long distances can come in and give rise to um, the requirement for resummations of your perturbative expansion, even to learn things like the viscosity at leading order. Um, now what I haven't addressed is what to do for systems that are far from equilibrium. And um, partly that's because I don't think we really know. If it's far from equilibrium and all the physics is in the deep infrared and the coupling is very small, you can probably use classical methods like this. You just erase that part and you put in your known initial distribution, whatever that is. But if you want to really do that in an interacting theory in a sensible way, you have to know your density matrix and know how to represent it, which is very non-trivial. And um, the right thing to do would be this closed time path with a density, uh, with some general density matrix hanging here. And if you know how to write down that density matrix, then you have a set of tools, um, which will be even more difficult to use because you can't Fourier transform in the time domain since your density matrix has one form here. It'll have a different form at a later time. Um, and I don't think we have very good tools to treat a far from equilibrium system. If it's close to equilibrium, you rewrite the departure from equilibrium in terms of unequal time equilibrium things using fluctuation dissipation. And then you try to use this technique. Okay. So I thank the organizers, probably on the behalf of all of the speakers for this week, because I think they put together a really good set of students for us to lecture to. And we've really enjoyed the, the questions in particular that you guys are taking an active participation and um, and we hope you get as much or more out of the next two weeks. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So this, this problem that you mentioned that your density matrix in principle also changes over time. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in, in these small departures from equilibrium, in principle, they should also be there, but we can ignore them because of some hierarchy? Or? Okay, I, I work very hard to express the information that I want about close depart small departures from equilibrium in terms of unequal time but equilibrium correlation functions. And if I can do that, that's the fluctuation dissipation part which I talked about in the last lecture. If I can do that, then I have to calculate something like this in equilibrium where this isn't an issue. 
But that always involved, well, for transport, certainly, that involves small frequencies. There's some things actually, just to be fair, where I don't actually want a small frequency limit or some nasty, okay, for the photon rate, you want an on-shell limit, which is also hard. But for the dilepton rate, for instance, you actually want a correlation function in a deeply space, a deeply time-like region. And their perturbation theory converges for a couple of terms and then has the same kind of infrared breakdown as our thermodynamic properties did. So there are some quantities where perturbation theory works at least a couple of orders. I'm being too pessimistic just for, just to warn you that there are actually rocks in the river. And a strong current, don't go swimming. We already heard about that. Sorry. Maybe further questions can be asked over lunch or something. Good.